Hey guys, welcome to the channel, as you see in the thumbnail what if, Issei was only man in this world part 2. Before I start, please do support for more awesome content, and subscribe my channel and like this video. Though support and follow the nefarious doctor for writing that awesome fanfic, and also make sure to comment on this story, link in the description. Let's start this video. Issei and Valerie clashed as the two were fighting without their as units for the first half. Valerie was smiling as she clashed with Issei's swords. Not bad. You are using speed to try and get ahead of me. That is a smart tactic, but not good enough. Valerie said as she pushed back and began to attack him, which worried Issei since he had watched her battles in the Mondo Grasso, but fighting her for real was totally different from what he'd seen, since the force behind her strikes made Issei worry for his life. But strangely, I was also excited at the same time. Issei has clashed before within his unit, but it was a different feeling in the battle with Valerie. Something in his soul screamed and told him to fight back against Valerie, despite the pressure and the high chance she'd destroy him in action. Valerie, on the other hand, was amused by Issei's resolve and reaction to clash with her, considering that she was holding back more of her strength to gauge his skills with a sword. He's not as strong or skilled as I am when it comes to swordplay, but when it comes to his reaction time, he's able to keep up with me, so that's a start. Valerie said as she clashed with Issei and saw that he was keeping up with her in terms of speed. Valerie continued clashing with Issei and saw that his reaction time was awe-inspiring since Issei was able to block Valerie's strikes and was able to get in her guard a few times and try to strike her body. However, Valerie was able to stop it with an armored hand, thanks to her is. I see, so that's how you are keeping up, Valerie said with a calm tone as she pushed Issei away and was amused by his reaction before speaking to him. Your reaction time is much better than mine, as well as your speed. I can tell you did a lot of training despite it only being a week. Tell me, does Charles give you some special reward when you do well? Issei blushed as he could tell what Valerie was doing, and it worked as he coughed into his fist and replied. W well, he makes a nice body pillow. Oh really? Is he hot? I know what you are doing, so quit it already. Issei yelled as Valerie laughed at Issei's tomato red face as he switched from his dual blades to his guns, which made Valerie stop laughing as she started running to dodge the barrage of bullets. At the same time, Issei kept his focus on her and tried to keep her away, since he knew that if Valerie got too close, he'd be done for. I can't keep up with her and my skills with a sword due to her strength and experience. Speed and reaction time is one thing, but soon Valerie will find a way to make it pass to take me down, so I got to wear her out by keeping my distance. Issei said as Valerie was pondering something along the lines Issei was thinking. Issei is trying to keep his distance to wear me out. He knows I can easily destroy him in close combat, so I have to try and close the gap. Valerie calculated in her mind as she spoke to her partner. Albion. I have Maya's shield on standby. If I can make it past his barrage, then I should be able to get close enough to take him down. Valerie said as Albion nodded. Of course, but be careful. Issei could still equip his is and go all out. I'll have the is ready as well, should that happen. Albion said as he began doing his orders while Valerie thanked him. Aw, thanks, dad. Let's shut up. It's only to make sure you don't go too overboard or get too cocky. Albion said with a stutter as Valerie giggled and used her sword to deflect the bullets when they got too close for comfort. Issei stopped as he let his guns cool down from the shooting before he readied his armored arms. He saw Valerie charge in and clash with Issei as he focused on defense while Valerie went on the offense. The two never showed an ounce of mercy for either side to give in as they continued clashing, while Chifaya could tell that the match would be ending soon, since she could tell that Issei was getting tired from trying to keep up with Valerie. He's using his his armor to give him a better chance to stand up to Valerie and last for so long until Valerie gets in close. Not a bad strategy since during the training, Issei does seem to have more skills in the is rather than skills in combat training. Defaya said as she looked at the time and saw that only 2 minutes had passed, and Issei's shield was at 80%, while Valerie's was at a mere 90%. Issei stayed on the defense until he saw an opening before grabbing Valerie by her shoulder and trying to slam her into the ground, which would have worked if Valerie hadn't used her as wings and boosters to give her the chance to break free. Nice try. Now, let's see how good you are in the air. Valerie said as she donned the rest of her as armor before Issei smiled at the challenge and equipped his armor. Be careful, Issei. Remember that you have 75% power, while Valerie still has 85% power. I suggest trying to keep her on her toes with your sword skills to keep her from trying to get you down. Bragg proposed as Issei agreed and summoned his swords before using his boosters to give him a speed boost, as Valerie clashed with Issei, surprised to see that she was on the defense now, while Issei kept trying to attack her. Impressive. Valerie said as she observed Issei clashing with her. 
He seems to have had some training in using his is more than normal weapons. Issei probably has been focusing on his swordsmanship and weapons training during the past week. He seems to have improved. Let's see how much he can take before he starts to run out of power. The white dragon is that Valerie pilots may not have as much offensive power as the red dragon does. Still, what the white dragon lacked in power, the is made up for with a powerful defensive wall and the ability to drain energy from other is to make its shield stronger. Issei knows this, which is why he is trying to push Valerie to focus solely on her shield so she wouldn't have time to drain his is for power. This strategy worked for a good minute until Valerie saw her opening, she struck Issei in the chest and began to absorb some of his power until Issei used his sword to send her back, but Issei could feel the power loss as Drake spoke to him. Our is now at 50% power. I suggest a different plan of attack. I have a plan. Attack. Issei then roared as he brought out his guns and began to assault Valerie with his rain of bullets. She focused on her shield as she looked at Issei, taking place a reasonable distance away from her as he kept aiming at her arms and legs. Not bad. I can tell that Issei has really improved, but I'm afraid it's time to end this farce. Valerie said as she ended her shield, she flew through the sky and placed her left hand out as a giant sphere formed within it. Let's see how you handle all of the power I absorbed through my shield, Valerie said as Issei switched to his shield and took it head on before feeling the power of Valerie's attack blast right through the protection as they shattered to pieces. Issei was sent flying into the ground. A massive explosion covered the entire ground with smoke as Valerie knew the battle was over while Issei was groaning in pain. Issei. Stay down. We only have 26% power left. I was able to transfer the power to the Is shield to keep you safe, but to prevent you from taking serious damage, I had to use the extra energy we have, but the shield drained them so quickly. Dryag shouted at her partner, hoping to get Issei to call the match before she could see Issei slowly standing up. Dryag. Do we have enough power for the other weapon? Issei muttered as Drake was shocked at the question before replying to him. Yes, but why do you know? There is no way I'm going to let you make such a suicidal move. Drake said as Issei formed the armor into his knight form before speaking to his partner. Drake. If I'm going down, then I'll go down knowing I gave it all I had, but if I surrender, then it'll feel like I didn't give it my all. Don't you feel the same way about fighting with all you have? Issei asked as he knew that he could barely move his arms at this point, but he would much rather pass out from energy exhaustion rather than surrender. Drake was silent for a bit before seeing the smoke begin to lift as she sighed her partner's stubbornness. Fine. But we're having a serious talk about reckless behavior in battle when you are in the hospital bed. Eel, Issei said as he smiled at his partner, feeling the wing boosters begin to ignite. Now transfer all power to the wing boosters. Valerie was quiet as she waited for the smoke to clear up until she saw a red blur appear out of the smoke and head towards her, which shocked the girl, but made her smile as she was glad this wasn't over. That's it, Issei Haidu. Could you show me what you made of? Don't hold anything back. Valerie shouted as Issei sped past her and made his way to the top of the dome around the arena. Now transfer all power to the Dragon Buster, Issei said as a massive railgun appeared on his back in place of his shoulder cannons. The railgun began to charge up with all of the power inside of it until Issei aimed it at Valerie, who looked excited as Issei fired it at the Silver Demon. Take this Valerie. Longinus Smasher. Issei shouted as the railgun fired at the White Dragon Empress. Albion. Get ready. Valerie shouted as the is summoned multiple bits that combined and became a massive dome of sorts as the railgun hit the crown. The bits began to absorb the power from the railgun blast and transferred all power towards Valerie, who was smiling in glee at the extra power. Valerie then fired all of the power at the top of the dome. The energy blast was a mix of white and red light until the attack ended. Issei was gliding toward the ground very quickly until Valerie caught him and used her as to catch him and head towards the ground. Issei was passed out and tired from the excessive amount of energy he used in battle. Issei's is went back to its standby form before Valerie chuckled at him. That was so much fun, Issei. Let's fight again when you're a bit stronger. Valerie said as she pecked his forehead and handed him to the is hospital staff. They took Issei to rest up while the IS maintenance group took Dryag to get some much-needed repairs. Valerie sat on the bench to see Chifayu smirking at her. He lasted 4 minutes and 59.9 seconds. He almost matched my time when I fought you at my best. Chifayu said as she timed it on her stopwatch, which made Valerie smile at her before the Silver Demon looked at the sky with a large grin. He'll come to match me as he gets stronger. Heck, he might even be able to kick your ass as well, Chifayu. Valerie said as she drank the offered water bottle, while Chifayu could imagine the red dragon defeating her in battle one day. I guess we'll have to see. After all, it's only the beginning of the first year. Chifayu said as she looked at the sky and imagined the possibilities that were to come this year. Meanwhile, Phantom Task was doing their preparations. Impressive. 
Who would have thought that the rookie would have been able to do so well against Valerie? He's definitely on the watch list. Nobunaga said as he looked at the footage of the battle before him while smiling at Issei Haidu talking to his is and then readying his final attack. Oh. Watching that last stand was like seeing a samurai refusing to give in defeat. It's making me so excited to meet this boy in person. Maybe he'll even fit my list of what I want in my future husband and wife. Nobunaga said as he took out his journal and looked at his list. Requirements for my husband. He must be strong in body and spirit. He must be a strong man who will appreciate me and not just my female body. He will love my cooking even though I might mess up at times. And is a fan of the Japanese culture and wants to end the is. I say Haidu is from Japan, so perhaps one of them is filled out, but I must see more of him. Nobunaga said as he began to find out all he could about Issei Haidu and research ways to get Issei to join Phantom Task. Issei Haidu, I shall test you when I unleash my juggernaut to test your body and spirit. So prepare yourself. Nobunaga shouted as he prepared the juggernaut to be ready to fight Issei Haidu, the Red Dragon Emperor. Infinite Stratos Hospital Room. Ow. That stings Charles. Issei shouted as Charles glared at him. Well, this is what you get for being so reckless. Now take your shirt off. Charles said as Issei grumbled but did so as Charles blushed seeing Issei's bare back in front of her. Sure, Charlotte has seen him before, but seeing his back, fresh from battle, is making her want to drop the act and bathe him. Charles then proceeded by placing some of the rubbing alcohol on his back and then the healing cream on his bruises. Issei moaned at the cool touch of the cream, which made Charles smile at the idea as he sat on Issei's rear and began to rub the cream on his bare back and made her way to the front of his chest, making Issei moan some more at Charles' soft hands massaging his aching back. A man Charles. You can really become a masseuse if you want to Issei moaned as his grunts and moans made Charles blush. His cheeks were red as an apple, while he continued massaging Issei's sore back until Charles leaned forward and whispered in his ear, something that made Issei moan a bit but nodded as he turned over to reveal his chest, which made Charles lick his with glee. As he proceeded to massage his chest and stomach while rubbing more cream on him, before admiring the firmness of his muscles and his chest, liking their volume, before checking out Issei's abs and loving their form before looking at Issei's pants and blushing at the thought of seeing his secret weapon. Charles was about to unhook Issei's pants and rub the weapon as well until. I think Issei can get that spot on his own, Chifayu said as Charles froze before turning to see Chifayu walking towards the disguised Frenchwoman before throwing her outside the room, leaving Charles disappointed she couldn't see its proper form, but the size of his tent made Charles blush at the idea of how large it was. Issei Haidu? I think your sword is much sharper than mine will ever be. Charles said as Kanzashi was hiding in the hallways and using a fan like her sisters to hide her bloody nose while writing something in a book she was writing in. Oh man, this stuff writes itself, Kanzashi said as she blushed as her brain was going into overdrive while writing her fantasy with her, Issei, and the disguised Frenchwoman. Now that the match was over, the school was excited to watch the game through the camera feed as many of the girls admired Issei being able to clash with Valerie. In contrast, a few of the other IS members, Hauki and Cecilia, watched in amazement and excitement as they could tell that Issei was giving it all he had, especially on his final attack, which made the duo proud of being able to last so long against the Silver Demon. Little did Issei Haidu know that his popularity and respect grew, as well as his fan club with him and Charlotte Denois. And now that the exhibition match ended, it was time for Issei to take a nap. Ah, I'm Aizumi Karuko. It's nice to meet you. I'm the vice president of the newspaper club. I'm here to do a scoop on the hotly discussed freshman Issei Haidu Kun special interview. Meizumi said as Issei groaned at the attention he was getting from the school. Apparently, the whole school was able to see the match due to the broadcast that the student council president of the school showed to everyone, which led to the party to celebrate Issei being able to hold his own against Valerie for almost five minutes and came close to match Shifayu Oromura's time. Issei groaned once more as he looked to see Charlotte patting his back for comfort. It's okay, Issei. You might as well get used to this since it will happen in the future, given your reputation. Charlotte said as Issei sighed, but nodded as he understood what she was saying. Yeah, I know, Charles, but it's not easy for me, since I'm not exactly a big fan of being interviewed all the time, since reporters are just vultures looking for the next big story to feast on so they can get a paycheck. Issei said as he saw the way Natasha hated the reporters who tried to interview him without asking for permission, which led to a protective Natasha being his bodyguard and destroying the reporters' cameras. Also, Tabane was a bit of help on her part since she ruined some of the arrogant reporters by revealing their dirty laundry to their bosses. Aki patted his back and replied. Hey, I hear you since reporters can be a pain in the ass, but you get used to it. Believe me. Haki said as she shared her annoyance with reporters. Then, then, Haidu-kun. 
Please state your thoughts on becoming the class representative and clashing with Valerie Linaria. Here. She held the recorder in front of me, her eyes shining like the ones of a naive kid. There's no way I'm getting out of this, is there? Issei asked as the girls shook their heads, making Issei sigh as he then nodded. Very well then. Clashing with Valerie was an incredible experience, and even though I lost against her, she still said that I was the second person to clash with her for almost five minutes. That's why I intend to become stronger to fight Valerie Linaria again so I can defeat the Brunhold. Jafai Oromura. That is my goal at this school, but I still wish to one day soar among the stars. Issei said as the girl smiled and cheered loudly at the declaration. Wonderful, although I was expecting something more like don't mess with me, or I'll tear you apart. Or something cool like that. Meizumi said as Issei raised a brow at this and replied. What do you think I am? A gang leader? Issei asked as Meizumi ignored that question and then pulled out a camera. Please let us document this by taking a picture of you, Meizumi said as she pushed Issei to stand in front of the table and readied the camera as Cecilia, Hauki, and the rest of the class stood next to him. Still, Issei didn't mind since he expected this from them until Meizumi took the picture. Come on, partner. Live a little. These will be the best four years of your life, so enjoy yourself. Dry Ag said as Issei chuckled at his partner's reply before nodding. Well, now that the interview is out of the way. Let's get this party started. Issei shouted as the girls cheered and began to really get into the party. Brig was right. After all, it was a night to celebrate his first battle, so it was okay to let loose instead of focusing on his training. Charlotte smiled as she observed Issei interacting with the other girls in their class and looked at his back before sighing to herself. She wanted to do nothing more than confess her feelings for Issei and reveal her true self, but she knew that if she did, then her father would pull her out and Charlotte would never see him again. Hey Charles. Come on and join the party. Issei called out as Charlotte smiled at the invite and joined them. Maybe it'll be nice keeping up the act a bit longer, Charlotte muttered as she walked over to Issei and drank some fruit punch with Haki standing on one of the tables and singing very well due to a dare that Han gave the kendo champion. After all, I can spend more time with Issei and possibly see how sharp his sword really is. Charlotte thought as she still recalled the feel of her friend's weaponry. Defy was smiling as she ended a phone call from her brother. She was happy that Ichika finally had a normal life away from the Az and could enjoy being with his girlfriends. I'm happy that Ichika finally has some peace since I wanted to keep him away from this chaos, Jafayu said as she closed her computer and was about to leave her office when a voice entered the room. Oh? Leaving so soon, Jafayu. We could have a chat before you leave tonight. The voice said until Jafayu summoned her sword and swung it behind her to see the eyes of the demon who's been hunting not just her but also Tabane Shinono. Nabunaga. I'm surprised you left your little phantom to come see me. Jafayu said as Nabunaga chuckled at the woman before pushing the sword away. Oh please, Jafayu. That's rich coming from a pathetic excuse of a human. Nabunaga said as he sat in her desk chair. Oh, wait. You aren't exactly human. Just a genetically engineered experiment to be used for mass production to continue piloting the witch's toys and causing more deaths and destruction. I already told you I am not like those people who abuse their as authority, Jafayu said as Nabunaga chuckled at the Brunhold before leaning back in the chair. Oh really? And do you know about the many resources that are wasted to build those toys that the government allows to be used by any woman? How many deaths have been committed because the as soldiers did good by killing innocent people who have done nothing? How about the civilizations that have been destroyed because the as users got a bit reckless with their weapons? Nabunaga said as he then leaned forward, glaring at Jafayu. You may not see the effect of what happens to the people when your government funds the as soldiers and lets them get away with whatever they pull, but I've seen them, and trust me when I say that you'll soon see just how dangerous the witch's toys really are, Nabunaga said as Jafayu glared back and asked. What do you mean by that, Nabunaga? Jafayu asked as Nabunaga chuckled at the question before responding. Tell me, how would you feel if your little brother was in danger because of the is? Nabunaga said as Jafayu then pinned him to the wall. You stay away from Michika, her isle. What? Kill me. Do it, and I'll reveal to the whole world exactly who you really are, and the crimes that the government has allowed you to commit, because your as girls are easy to please with a few drinks, deals, and banging them in the sack. Nabunaga said as he kicked Jafai away, who landed in the wall before the Demon King dusted off the uniform. Also, I wouldn't want to bring innocent people into this war. I'm trying to save the world by getting rid of the weapons that were once meant to help humankind touch the stars. Still, Tabane decided to indulge the government by letting them make her toys that helped humankind become weapons of war that made women on the street have so much pride and arrogance that they became public enemy number one. Nabunaga said as he went to the office window that showed the sea before opening it. The cool breeze blew inside the room as Nabunaga turned around and glared at Jafai. 
You are just a government experiment to make super soldiers to keep these fighters alive, but I know who you really are. A puppet that was programmed and built in a lab only to kill, destroy, and not give care about anyone but their orders like a loyal soldier, so let me ask you, Jafai Uramura. Do you really care about others, or do you only pretend you actually care about anyone, since you don't know what emotions are? Nobunaga then leaped out the window, causing Chifayu to run to the window to see that Nobunaga wasn't there at all. PCH. A hologram. He sent his message to me and wants to know what I'll do next. Chifayu said as she looked at her office desk and saw a picture of her little brother. She smiled at his face before hugging it to her chest. I won't let anyone harm you, Ichika. I had to choose between you and Madoka, but I saw you as a better person to raise than her. Jafayu said as she looked at her photos of her past before clenching her fist due to the reminder that Nobunaga put in her head. I can't let Ichika or anyone else know about who I really am. Tabane may have kept my secret, as well as Ichika's, but if what Nobunaga said is true, then he's planning on going to war and making the world turn against the Infinite Stratos. Jafayu said as she sighed before looking at the city from the Infinite Stratos Academy. In all my years, I never questioned the mission and did what I thought was right, but am I really making a change? Sometimes, I'm starting to think that Nobunaga is right in some areas. Chifayu said to herself as she looked at her hands and saw that they were covered in blood before shaking it off as the hallucination left her mind. Ha. <laughs> and here I thought I finally stopped seeing that damn hallucination. Chifayu said as she sighed and left her office. She went straight to her bedroom and laid on top of her bed. The thread has been made, and now it's the calm before the storm. Issei was carrying a drunk Charlotte Denwa on his back due to the newspaper club deciding to spike the punch a bit. Apparently, the Frenchwoman was a bit drunk after his first three glasses, which led to Issei seeing some other sides of the girls. Something was up as soon as Hauke said she wanted to sing and began to do a concert in the cafeteria. Okay. Note to self. Watch how much you drink. Issei said as Charlotte giggled while rubbing her head on Issei's back. M.M. Are we going to sleep together? I enjoy cuddling your warm body with my own. Charlotte said as she hiccuped a bit, which made Issei chuckle at her cute side before opening their dorm room and placing Charlotte on the bed before locking the door. He. I want some snuggles. Charlotte said as she sprawled all over the bed and gestured that she wanted Issei to snuggle with her before Issei decided to help her get dressed. Come on, you silly drunk. Let's get you some pajamas. Issei said as he handed Charlotte a nightgown, which made Charlotte smile as she stripped herself to her underwear and hugged Issei. M.M. So warm. Charlotte said as she rubbed her head on his chest, making Issei pat her on the head before getting her in the nightgown. You really are turning the affectionate level up to a hundred, you know that. Issei asked as Charlotte smiled up at him and nodded before rubbing her head on his chest some more. M.M. It's because you are so warm, like the sun. I want snuggles now. Charlotte said as she held onto his body before Issei carried Charlotte to their bed and placed a pillow in her arms. It worked as Charlotte was relaxing with the pillow until Issei decided to go to the patio and relax with the cool breeze of the sea with the moon as his witness and friend. I'm really starting to enjoy this place. It's crazy, but it's fun at the same time. Issei said as he felt his phone vibrating before he looked at the ID and answered the call. Hey cow cow. I haven't heard from you in a while. How's high school on the mainland and our family doing? Issei asked as the caller was smiling at his question before replying to him. Oh, I've been well. I've been keeping an eye on Ichika for you, and he seems to be doing okay with his girls. Kao Kao said as he was cleaning his spear before looking around and, seeing no one approaching him, decided to continue. Listen. I'm going to need you to trust me on what's been happening for the past month. What do you mean? Apparently, there's been a lot of buzz going around about this group known as Phantom that's recruiting people to tear down the Infinite Stratos. I don't know all the details, but they've been checking out a couple of neighborhoods that aren't exactly thrilled about the way the government is doing things. Kao Kao said as Issei sighed, not being a politician, but knowing how much the political group seems to be influencing the Infinite Stratos to be the next war machine. Have they been making any kind of threats or anything? Nope. I was checking out the streets and speaking to a few people. I've got my group checking out this team, and you remember the guy who was executed a few years ago. The guy who called himself Nobunaga. Yeah, I remember him. He was all over the world and was executed for trying to reveal the crimes that the government hid from the public and how trigger-happy his users were allowed to kill without any real consequences. What about him? Issei asked, not liking where this was going until Kao Kao responded. From what I can tell, the guy who's running Phantom seems to be related to the same guy and is calling the shots. He's got some deep pockets and knows what he's doing. He's got some serious beef with Tabane Shinono and Chifayu Orimura, but what are they planning? I wanted to keep you informed about them and see if Tabe or Chifayu can tell you anything, though I doubt you'll get anything from them. Yeah. 
Hey, keep me updated on your end. You've always been a better politician than me when it comes to keeping the streets clean and making sure our family is safe. Issei said as Kao Kao smirked and nodded. Yeah, well, you've always been a better fighter than me and knew how to bond with people better than me. Kao Kao said as he and Issei shared a laugh before Issei looked at the full moon and smiled at it. It's a nice night out tonight, isn't it? Yeah. It sure is, so when are you coming to see us again? Kao Kao asked as Issei smiled and replied. In a few weeks. I've got to make sure I can survive that long in this place, but the people here are nice. Crazy but nice. Be careful you don't get too comfortable there, or we'll drag your ass out of there. Ha. I'd like to see you try without your spear. Issei said as he laughed a bit more before continuing. It's good to hear from you again, Kao Kao. Really. I'll try to make some time to catch you up on what's going on here and set you up with a girl if you and Jean don't work out. Hey. I'll have you know Jean and I are in a committed relationship. Yeah. After I knock some sense into you that Jean had the hots for you before she was thinking we were a thing. I blame those stupid manga stores selling that stupid BL manga. Yeah, you and me both, Issei said before seeing the time and stifling his yawn. Hey, listen, I got to go. My roommate is getting a bit aggressive. Hey, I hear you. Stay safe, Issei, and watch your back. I should be telling you that. See you later Kao Kao. Hey. See you. Issei ended the call as he walked back into his room and smiled at his sleeping roommate's body. He tucked some of her hair behind her ear before in her forehead. I'll make sure you are safe, Charlotte. I promise. Issei said as he climbed into his bed and snuggled next to Charlotte, who seemed to smile more at the affectionate touch. Kao Kao ended the call as well, then walked out of the bar and was going to get into his car before seeing a suspicious-looking woman enter an alleyway, which set off some alarm bells in his head as he grabbed his metal spear and headed into the alleyway. Kao Kao was confused about where the woman was until he felt someone grab him by the back of his jacket. He was then slammed into the wall before he was face to face with a familiar person. Defy Uorimura. The figure chuckled at him before slowly choking him. Nope, but that's all you remember. Forget you saw my face and I'll leave you alive, but try to come after me and you won't like what you see. I'm a lot stronger than you think and you don't want to see my bad side. Defy is to Pelginger said as Kao Kao was losing his vision as he was trying to get out of the chokehold until he held onto her arm so tight some blood leaked from her arm before he was unconscious. DCH. Annoying punk should have never come down here. The Chifayu copycat said as she left the alleyway before pulling out a phone, typing in 911 and explaining the emergency, ending the call, and tossing the phone away. I can't wait for our little reunion, Wani Chan. The Chifayu copycat said as she then equipped an is and flew into the night. The wheels of fate are turning as the storm is slowly approaching. Defy was currently waking up as she couldn't stop the words from Nobunaga ringing in her head after last night. You may not see the effect of what happens to the people when your government funds the as soldiers and lets them get away with whatever they pull, but I've seen them and trust me when I say that you'll soon see just how dangerous the witch's toys really are. What did you mean by that, Nobunaga? Chifayu asked herself as she took a shower and his words came to her mind afterward. Tell me, how would you feel if your little brother was in danger because of these? CR Ak. A massive fist-sized hole was in the shower wall. Chifayu breathed heavily, gritting her teeth as she saw Nobunaga's smug smile appear. I'll never let that bastard near my brother. I will protect him. Chifayu said as she then sighed at the damage before making a mental note to let the repair crew know about the damage to her shower wall. Chifayu then finished up her shower before she accidentally destroyed more of the shower wall. Defy then left her room after getting dressed and headed towards her office, but when she arrived there, Brundled was surprised to see a man standing next to the door, before the man walked towards Shifayu and stopped in front of her. Defyu Orimura. Yes. Who are you? My name is Kagura Mitsuki. I'm here to ask you some questions about your whereabouts yesterday evening. The man known as Kagura said as Shifayu looked at him and could tell he was serious. This Kagura Mitsuki is a rather tall, broad-chested young man. He wore a white robe-like shirt with long sleeves that were open just above his abdomen, two black belts were fastened on the sleeves. Kagura wore wrist wraps that covered his palm to his elbow, and two metal cuffs sat above the wraps on his wrists. On the lower half of his shirt, two brown belts are fashioned, below this, a large and loose brown belt hangs, and it has a huge golden buckle. Over his shirt, he wears a large black cape that is separated into three individual clothes. The interior of the cape is a deep crimson red, while the exterior is decorated with a golden insignia on the outer clothes, the cape is held onto Kagura's body via a light brown strap. He wore plain black pants and light brown shoes with metal toe caps. That's a unique uniform. May I ask who sent you? Jifayu asked as Kagura chuckled before replying. People who are above your pay grade, Kagura said as he gestured towards the door. 
I don't want to have to arrest you, so why don't we just chat in your office? Sounds good. Jafayu sighed as she nodded and went into her office with him before Kagura settled into her chair, which made Jafayu pissed off as she couldn't believe someone was tough enough to make her mad. Kagura didn't care as he even put his feet up and on her desk before he even picked up her coffee cup and took a sip of it before admiring the taste of it. Not bad coffee. I could really go for a chair like this, Kagura said as he leaned back in the chair and enjoyed the coffee some more before setting the mug down on the desk. This made Jafayu make a mental note to destroy the mug and replace it with a nicer one. What do you want, Kagura? Jafayu asked, holding in her anger before Kagura began to talk. It's about what's happening on the mainland. Tell me, where were you yesterday evening between 10 pm and 10.30 pm? Why is that important? Just answer the question. Jafayu sighed as she took a deep breath and nodded. Very well. I was at my office finishing up some paperwork for the day, and I had just sent Maya to her apartment since she kept falling asleep when helping me. Jafayu said as she then even pointed to the camera on top of the ceiling. Check my office security camera if you don't believe me, Jafayu said. Kagura didn't care about the camera, so he pulled a flip phone from his pocket and held it out for her. Jafayu then took it to see Kao Kao had a brace around his neck, along with bruise marks on his neck. Jafayu then looked at Kagura, and he then showed a video of someone who looked like a younger Jafayu, slamming Kao Kao into the wall, before leaving him there for the ambulance to appear. Yesterday evening, we received a phone call from this location about the victim Kao Kao, and this woman claimed she was Jafayu Oramura. At first, we didn't believe her, but when we checked for DNA on the blood we found under the victim's fingernails, the results came back as yours, Jafayu. The guru said as Jafayu gripped the bar on her desk and clenched her teeth, seeing this look alike on the screen. Were you able to catch her? The one who called in Kao Kao. Unfortunately, no, but I had to see if you knew her, Kagura then took his feet off her desk and began to walk towards the exit before stopping at the door. Jafai was about to ask him what else he wanted, but was surprised to see Kagura give him a warning. You shouldn't show yourself to the public for a while, and especially your brother. I'll tell them you don't know her nor ask you what your relationship is of this lookalike. Kagura said as he knew Jafai was shocked by his words before he left, with many of the female students being shocked to see someone like Kagura leave the office of Brunhold herself, which then began to spread like wildfire, all the way to even the first year students. Wait. You mean to tell me a man was in Oromura sensei's office? Cecilia asked as Haki nodded and replied. That's what the rumors are. I even checked it out with Han, and she confirmed that the rumors were true. The man was actually Kagura Mitsuki, and I heard he works for the police force and is a cool guy once you get to know him. Haki said, much to Cecilia's surprise, before she asked if the kendo warrior knew Kagura but received a shake of her head instead of a nod. No. Kagura knows my sister Tabane, and the two are acquaintances at best, since Tabane is annoyed when Kagura puts down her ideas for new as units. Kagura is surprised that the one who was responsible for such machines acts more like a child than an adult. Haki explained that Cecilia had never met her. Still, based on what Issei told him about Tabane and the rumors about her then, it's understandable that the woman can be a bit childish at times, but she's a very competent woman who's a bit unique. Hey, Cecilia, do you have any idea where Issei and Charles are? Haki asked since she had yet to see them enter the classroom before Cecilia replied. Oh, last I heard, Issei asked for special permission to go check on his friend who ruthlessly attacked yesterday. We should be able to see him around sometime in the early afternoon. Cecilia explained as Haki nodded since she knew that Issei probably had some friends on the mainland, and if she heard one of her friends was in the hospital, she'd go and see them, too. I hope his friend is okay, but why did Charles go with him? Haki asked as she was concerned about Issei's well-being, since the French man seemed to be a bit frisky with Issei at the party yesterday evening. Especially since he turned into an affectionate drunk that wanted Issei's attention and even rubbed his ass all over Issei's crotch, as she recalled berating the Frenchman when he left the rooftop on the first day of the semester, which is where Hauke learned something new about the Frenchwoman. Flashback. What the hell do you think you're doing? Are you trying to seduce Issei Sen or something? Hauke yelled as she continued to shake Charles back and forth. I swear it's not what you think. I was just a bit jealous of Issei looking at our teacher's milk jugs and wanted some of his attention. Charles yelled as Haki stopped shaking him. She then let the Frenchman go and sighed at him. Well, I find it hard to believe since it looked like you wanted to say to bone you and take you up here away from everyone, Haki said before she saw his chest was opened up a bit until she saw some meat on his chest. Charles, Haki asked as she grabbed Charles's shirt and ripped off the cover before blushing in shock at the two massive orbs before her. Holy shit. She's probably my size but maybe smaller than me. Haki shouted in her head as she then looked at Charles and asked. Who are you? Charles sighed as he decided to come clean. 
I wanted to get surgery since I always felt more comfortable as a girl than a boy, so I went behind my father's back and got the surgery. Please don't tell his say about this. He'll freak out and report me to Oromura sensei. Aoki sighed to herself as she looked at Charles. She could tell that he could definitely be a beautiful woman before Hauki smiled and placed a hand on the Frenchwoman's left shoulder. I'll keep your secret, I promise, but if you want some advice on wooing a say or if you're interested in becoming a woman, then I'd be happy to help you, Hauki said as Charles blushed at the woman's appreciation and desire to help, before Charles looked down and asked. But do you think he won't see me as a weirdo or a freak if I say I'd prefer being a girl over a boy? Not at all. From what I've seen, Issei doesn't suspect that you are a boy transitioning to a girl, so I would keep that a secret from him for as long as you can, but when you are ready to tell him, then I'll be here to help you in, anyway, I can. Hauki said as Charles felt touched by the kindness of the Japanese woman. Thank you grand sir. What does that mean? Oh? It means big sister in French. Charles said with a large smile as Hauki blushed at the bright light shining off him before shielding her eyes from the light. That's so bright. I must protect this sweet little angel. Hauki said as she was happy to help the sweet angel keep her secret. You can count on me Charles. Hauki said with joy, as she was going to help Charles with his secret and help him confess his feelings towards Issei, after the surgery was complete. Then flashback. This is her chance to score some points with Issei before some of the other girls do. I happen to have suggested Charles go in a special outfit that'll show off his bust and beauty. Issei will be so shocked that he'll be more than willing to accept such a beautiful woman as a girlfriend. Aoki monologued in her head as she was hoping that the two would get closer before Kyoka and Kanzashi tried to ask Issei on a date, since she could tell that the other two girls wanted to ask out the only boy in their school. Still, the real challenge was if Cecilia wanted to date Issei as well. Hey, Cecilia, I've noticed you're not so snappy toward Issei lately. Is there a reason why? Hauki asked. Cecilia replied with a sigh. Well, we've become acquaintances at best that do show care about each other, which is why I'm worried that Frenchman will try something with Issei as he did back in the arena, Cecilia said as she knew that the Frenchman Charles had a crush on Issei and was worried about him being assaulted by that pervert from France. Aoki sighed in her mind as she was glad that Charles didn't have any competition from Cecilia before feeling her phone buzz as she looked at the message. It was a picture of Issei and Charles. Charles was wearing a sundress, which made him look absolutely stunning. Hauki read the message underneath the picture. Thank you for the dress grand sir. I'll tell Issei who I really am and thank you for supporting me. Hauki let out some tears of joy as she was so proud of Charles before Cecilia broke her out of her fantasy. Uh, excuse me, Miss Shinono, but who is that girl in that photo with Issei? I thought he was with Charles. Cecilia asked as Hauki froze in shock before Hauki poked her fingers together and whispered in the British woman's ear, who picked up all Hauki said before Cecilia leaned back and looked at Hauki with a passive face before yelling. What do you mean that girl Charles? Meanwhile, on the mainland. So you mean Hauki knew about you being a girl? Issei asked as Charlotte made a so-so motion. Well, not really. I told Hauki I was a boy going through the surgery to be a girl, so she decided to be a big sister and help me with confessing my feelings towards you. Charlotte said as she ate some ice cream while Issei groaned at that before muttering to himself. Probably because you are more of an imp than an angel, Issei said as Charlotte looked offended. Ah. Well, I never. I am a wonderful lady, but calling me an imp is so mean. Charlotte said as she then hugged his left arm between her and smiled at his reaction. Damn it. I hate it when you act like that. Issei said as he tried to push down the blush on his face before a voice called out to him. Issei? Issei hi do? The voice asked. Issei froze in shock until he slowly turned around to see his former girlfriend. Umelmano. What are you doing here? Issei asked as Uma looked nervous as if she didn't want to say something rude, while Charlotte narrowed her eyes at the woman, knowing it was the same girl who didn't care about Issei's feelings and only dated him on a dare. Oh. Well, I heard about Kao Kao and wanted to see how he was doing, Uma said as she nervously glanced down at a small basket she was carrying before Issei sighted her and asked. Are you trying to get back into Kao Kao's good graces after he dumped you after finding out that you are a player? I wasn't trying to play with either him or you. Oh really, because memory serves me well. You didn't care about my feelings and even told your friends that you were only dating me because of that dare. You even called the date, and I quote. A mediocre date that made me feel like I was playing house with a pathetic fool. Also, you used Kao Kao and tried to make me jealous of him. He's my best friend, and I'll be damned that I let a leech like you affect anyone else. Issei said as Yuma and Issei looked at each other before the students left Yuma alone, who looked down at her basket and turned around, heading back home. Issei and Charlotte were silent as they continued their walk until Charlotte broke it with a simple question. Do you still love her, Issei? Even after what she did to you? 
Charlotte asked as Issei stopped. He looked at the sky and liked the breeze that came through before sighing to himself. Honestly? No. I moved on from her, and I wished her the best of luck in the future. I was happy to have met Natasha, who was willing to help me not only move on from Yuma, but also told me that someday I'll meet someone who'll care about my feelings and help me become better, and vice versa. Issei said as he took her hand, causing her to blush, before he continued. And I'm glad for that because if I hadn't become an his user, that probably would have hurt me much worse than I could have imagined, so I'm grateful to be an his user and meet you, Charlotte, along with the others, Issei said with a smile, as Charlotte smiled before standing on her toes and took Issei's, much to his shock before Charlotte leaned away from him. I love you Issei Haidu. Charlotte said as Issei blushed. He took her hand and led her towards the hospital, before Charlotte heard him mumble under his breath. I love you too, Charlotte and Wah, Issei said as Charlotte smiled, happy that she went with him and confessed her feelings for him. Thank you mother from above. Charlotte prayed in thanks to her deceased mother, as a pillar of light shone down upon her, as if heaven itself had blessed her. However, while Issei has a reunion with a ghost from his past and an old friend, Brunhold is about to face another ghost from her past. DCH. Who does that bastard think he is, coming into my office, sitting at my desk, and sipping out of my coffee cup? Jafai yelled as she destroyed her cup and cleaned off her desk, before hearing a chuckle come from behind her. Aw, what's the matter, Jafai? Scared that a man actually has the guts to stand up to you and not let you walk all over him. A voice as Jafai turned around to see no one was at the front door before turning back around to see a familiar face sitting in her chair. A familiar face that looked just like her but was younger, back when Jafai was in high school. The woman sitting in front of her also had a petite body and had the same hairstyle and color as Jafai. Still, the Brunhold also noticed something familiar around the intruder's neck. A yellow locket that held a picture of Jafai holding a baby Ichika and looking at him with love and affection, while the other side of the locket showed Jafai looking away from Madoka, who was younger than Jafai and wanted to be held by her. But the older sibling didn't acknowledge her much less care about her little sister's existence. Hello Jafai. It's been a long time since we last saw each other, hasn't it? The intruder said as she narrowed her eyes at Jafai and asked, hearing no response. Aw, oh, what's wrong? Are you disgusted by the fact your little sister is alive and well? Oh, it's nice to see you too, Madoka. It's been a long time since I abandoned you and left you since I only cared about my little brother, since you were just a lab rat to be a super weapon. Ah, oh, thank you Chifayu. Nice to see you actually still care about me. Madoka said as she did a fake Chifayu impersonation of her voice. Madoka then saw a sword pointed at her throat. What are you doing here, Madoka, or should I call you M since you go by that now? Jafayu asked as Madoka didn't even flinch at the sword before pushing it away from her throat. Oh, please, as if you care what I'm called now. You made who you care more about clear 15 years ago when you left me behind and only cared about Ichika because you saw he was different and innocent when your one-year-old sister wanted to have a sister play with her and give her some actual love instead of the cold shoulder you gave me. Madoka yelled as she slammed a fist on the desk, causing a small crater to form underneath her fist before Madoka took a few deep breaths and stood up. However, the past doesn't matter. I'm only here to tell you that I won't be going after Ichika. I just wanted to see how he was doing since I don't hold resentment towards him. If anything, I'm glad he doesn't pilot the is since I plan to keep him out of phantom task and the is as much as I can. Madoka said as she smiled, recalling seeing her brother enjoying his life as a normal high school student and having two girlfriends. Really? Do you care about Ichika? You expect me to believe a monster like you could ever care about my little brother? Jafayu asked as Madoka laughed at her question as if it was a joke. Ha! Ah, me? A monster? That's hilarious coming from the great Brunhold, who is also a monster like me. Tell me, how do you sleep at night knowing your hands are covered in more blood than my own? How do you deal with the voices of the innocent people that you mercilessly slaughtered when you used that is? Madoka asked as she walked towards the balcony next to the office and smiled at the mainland in front of the academy, before looking back at Jafayu with a look of acceptance. Once Phantom Task destroys all of the infinite Stratos, the world will never know they even existed in the first place, and it'll be thanks to Nobunaga and a little help from the rabbit, Madoka said as she then summoned her own is and left the academy, leaving a shock Jafayu, as she was pondering what Madoka meant by her words. The world won't know they exist. And how does Tabane fit into this? She hates Phantom Task, right? Jafayu asked herself as she sat in her office chair. She groaned as she tried to process the fact that not only did her sister return, but that look of acceptance stayed in her mind. Why does she have the same look as those who are sent to die? Madoka smiled to herself as she then teleported to Phantom Task and bowed before Nobunaga, who was sitting on a special throne. Ah, welcome back Madoka. How was your visit with your brother and sister? 
Nobunaga asked as he patted Madoka on the head, which made the girl smile in joy. She enjoyed the affectionate touch before she replied to her master. Wonderful. My little brother is living the life you told me about. I still can't believe that you were able to change my brother's fate thanks to the rabbit's time machine. Madoka said as Nobunaga chuckled to herself. He looked at the throne he sat on before nodding. Indeed. The witch made something more useful than those war machines, and once the witch's toys are gone, the phantom shall finally be laid to rest and us along with it. Nobunaga said, and Madoka nodded in agreement, her face showing admiration. To build a better future for our world, we must vanish like the infinite stratos will soon, Madoka said, looking melancholy. Then she asked her master, in the original version of our world you went to, did Ever have a different fate? Nobunaga sighed as he looked at Madoka before patting her head. I'm sorry, Madoka, but your fate will either be death by your siblings or loneliness. People like you and me don't have a brighter future even in another world, which is why I want to change this world's fate. Instead of a future where the infinite stratos are the war machines and most women believe they are gods among men, they'll be brought down to the world as I make them come back to reality. Madoka smiled as she nodded before bowing to Nobunaga. And I, Madoka Orimura, your loyal servant, shall fight by your side and be of use to you as you see fit. I only desire for Ichika to live a life that isn't forced into the one he was given when he unlocked the infinite stratos. Madoka said as Nobunaga smiled at the assassin before hugging her with a look of gratitude. Do not worry, soon we'll show them. We will show them all. Nobunaga said as the sun began to set in the distance as the leader of Phantom Task wished to change this world from the fate of the original one. So this device will let me see alternate timelines. Madoka asked as Nobunaga nodded. A certain rabbit was knocked out and a bit of blood left her head. Yes. I'm sending you to the original timeline, should Ichika have awakened his talent, and let me tell you that the future of that world didn't have such a happy ending. Nobunaga said, and six-year-old Madoka nodded. She then felt her body and mind become transferred to a strange place. As the copycat of Jifayu opened her eyes, Madoka was frightened by the scene due to the chaos and destruction that lay right in front of her. Japan was reduced to destroyed buildings, bodies littered the streets, and weapons were thrown on the ground as swords or their weapons skewered infinite Stratos pilots. W what happened here? Madoka asked herself as she walked through the streets and rubble to see the Is Academy in utter terror, as the massive building that was a symbol of unity and trust between the countries, only to see it be reduced to nothing. Madoka held back her bile as she continued to head towards the Academy. There, she saw a massive stone littered with the names of many people, but two names stood out among them. Ichika Orimura. Madoka muttered as she then looked at the next one that stood out. Jifayu Orimura. It was shocking to see that the ultimate weapon for humanity, Jifayu Orimura, was killed in battle. At the same time, Ichika Orimura sacrificed himself to destroy Phantom Task. Still, after the war, many secrets were revealed as some terrorists of governments around the world have been assisting Phantom Task with their efforts to eliminate the infinite Stratos. Eventually, the terrorists rebelled against the world by creating a virus that was so powerful that it corrupted not just the war machines, but also the pilots, resulting in the terrorists being able to manipulate the IS and control the pilots. This resulted in the infinite Stratos, who weren't affected by the virus, being the protectors of the world in clashing and civilian areas, resulting in famine, war, disease, and work conditions becoming more demanding for the war. Sadly, the war between the terrorists escalated into a world war. I never wanted this to happen, you know. All I wanted was to give mankind a chance to touch the stars and see them with their own eyes, a voice said as Madoka turned around to see an older and weaker version of Tabane Shinono, who was stuck in a wheelchair with a taller and older version of Madoka stepping out from behind the rock. DCH. You just wanted to bring the stars down and label them with your little gadgets. You're as far from the stars as you get, and your little toys took away not just my little brother, but destroyed the world. The older Madoka said as she extended her arms to the area around them, with Tabane looking at said area with her eyes before looking at Madoka. If I had known this is what my babies would have done, then I would have stopped Ichika from becoming an his user and made sure that this future would never come to pass, Tabane said as Madoka looked in the distance with Tabane, before nodding in agreement with the scientist. You're not wrong. If I had the chance to go back in time, I would have done so many things differently, the older Madoka said as Tabane smiled and gave her a small pistol. Please kill me. Kill me before the bomb does it. Tabane said as she closed her eyes, accepting her fate as the older Madoka nodded before pointing the gun at her head and killing her, leaving Tabane with a content smile on her face, despite the blood leaving her body. The older Madoka then turned around as if she saw her younger past self and spoke to her. Stop this. Stop the world from a future like this. The older Madoka said as she pointed the gun to her head before pulling the trigger, scaring Madoka so much that when she returned to her own time, Nobunaga spoke to her as the girl was covered in a cold sweat. 
Are you okay, Madoka? Nobunaga asked as Madoka slowly walked out of the machine before looking at Nobunaga with a stern expression. We don't have much time. There are many things that we have to change before the future is ruined. Then flashback. And we are so close to our goal, brother. I only wish you and Jifayu understood why I am doing what I must to ensure that our future is secured. The infinite stratos must be erased, and Tabain Shinono must fall to make sure that the future I saw never comes to pass," Madoka said as she then walked out of her personal shower and began to dry herself off so she could get ready for the day. Ever since she saw the fate of the original world after Ichika Oromura became the only male as user, Madoka worked hard to ensure that Ichika would never be able to become the as user. Still, during her search, she found something odd. When investigating a cure for the genetic code that would prevent Ichika from using the is, the outcast was able to identify another strand of the Oromura code inside another person at his school. The boy named Issei Haidu was the third child to be born from Amiki Haidu, who had two miscarriages before trying one last time. After hearing there may be a way for their third child to be ensured that the child would be strong and healthy, the mother gladly accepted it, and the process was completed. Still, to Madoka's surprise, the genetic code was similar to the Oromura project that was used to create Madoka and her older siblings. However, the strand made sure that Issei wasn't bred to be a super soldier, but rather a healthy child who was given a better healing factor. Madoka knew that Issei seemed to have an interesting ability to control lesser is and non-personnel ones, which made her curious about his DNA and whether he possibly had one more powerful than the one from the Oromura project when Shifai, herself, and Ichika were created in the project before it was shut down. As Madoka dried herself off and prepared for the day ahead, her thoughts turned to her recent discoveries regarding Issei Haidu. She couldn't shake the feeling that his genetic makeup held the key to altering the course of history. Venturing out of her room, Madoka made her way to the hospital, where Issei met Kao Kao, her mind abuzz with plans and strategies. She needed to approach Issei discreetly, gather more information about his abilities, and uncover the truth behind his unique genetic code. I need to get some answers on this and see if Issei is perhaps the key to changing our timeline fate from the original one," Madoka muttered to herself as she put on a disguise of a school uniform that made her look like a random student and not a genetic clone of Jafai, though given the fact that her disguise was a very beautiful girl with a curvy figure. She has long black hair that reaches her knees and dark brown eyes. She is usually seen wearing the academy's uniform, which consists of a cropped blue blazer, an off-white button-up dress shirt, and a skirt that is the same blue as the blazer. She wears a red tie with a dress shirt and wears stockings with black boots. She has an outfit she wears casually for disguise purposes, which consists of a purple short-sleeved shirt with a purple belt and a long white skirt that reaches just slightly above her knees. She also chose to wear stockings with this outfit before she headed to the hospital. As Madoka made her way through the hospital courtyard, her eyes fell upon Issei Haidu before she approached him with a friendly smile, her demeanor warm and welcoming. Hey there, Issei, Madoka greeted him, her voice cheerful as she drew near. Issei looked up, his expression curious yet guarded. He recognized a move from afar, aware of her reputation as someone who had clashed with Kao Kao, one of the neighborhood's prominent figures, and was one of the ladies who made Kao Kao smile in battle, who didn't rely on the infinite stratos. Despite his apprehension, he returned her smile politely. Hey Mu, are you here to see your rival? Issei replied, his tone cautious but polite, as he was worried that Amu would try something with Kao Kao. Amu nodded, her smile widening. Indeed. I heard about him being hurt by Phantom Task, so I wanted to check on my rival, so she didn't die from a foolish death. It's nice to see you in person after you left the mainland. Yeah, it's been a while. Still, I'm sure he'll be glad to see you again, Issei said. Charlotte then approached Issei with a smile and hugged his left arm before greeting Madoka in her disguise. Hello there. Who might you be? Charlotte asked. Issei chuckled and responded. Oh, this is Amu. She was in my middle school class with Ichika and Kao Kao before she challenged Kao Kao to control his little group, which resulted in a tie. The two have been rivals since then, and Amu hates the is with a passion. She says they're a disgrace to real strength. Issei explained, and Amu nodded in response. Am straight. That's warrior talk, Issei said. Amu chuckled at Issei's personality. She had been able to get some info on his style and really enjoyed talking to him before recognizing Charlotte and Wa and asking Issei. So, Issei, do you have a hot date with you? Amu asked, making Issei blush as he rubbed the back of his head before nodding, causing Amu to smirk at the flustered teenager. Ah, don't look so embarrassed. I know your type of woman, especially since you love to talk about your harem plan during the break. I was 13 at the time and just watched in a nine. It wasn't my real dream. Issei grumbled as Charlotte giggled, watching the two, and recalled what Jean said to her about Issei's expressions. Both Amu and Issei began to bicker as if they were friends who hadn't seen each other in years. 
At least I don't pretend to get beaten so I could use my thighs to squeeze cow cow. Issei insinuated, making a moo blush at the comment before she stuttered a reply. W well, I also know you had a crush on that one girl that turned out to be a dude. Oh, you did not just go there, yaoi lover. Takes a pervert to no one, you yuri heartthrob. Issei and Amu shouted at each other as they began to wrestle in front of the hospital, Charlotte was not sure what to do before Jean stopped her. Let them have their spat. The two fight as if they were siblings, and it's always amusing, Jean said as she sipped some of her drink. After 15 minutes, the two stopped and laughed as if they weren't trying to kill each other. Good to see you again, Amu. And to you as well, Issei, Madoka said, keeping her persona up, while glad to associate with her friends again, even though it's under her disguise. But still, Madoka was able to obtain what she needed as she looked down at her knuckles and saw some of Issei's blood on it, making her smile in relief as Madoka got her hands on her target before going in to meet Cow Cow and see how he's doing after Madoka put him in the bed, gently of course, since she didn't want to kill him. Eventually, her secret will be leaked, but for now, she is content with being in the presence of her old friends again. Thanks for watching this video. If you really enjoy this video, like subscribe and comment down below and turn on that bell notification. Don't forget to support and follow the nefarious doctor for writing that awesome fanfic and also make sure to comment on this story link in the description. See you in the next video. Goodbye.